Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series on Introduction to Data Visualization. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Anna-Marie Crisan, who will be delivering this workshop. Uh, Anna-Marie is in the Computer Science D Division of the University of British Columbia, and uh, she also has her own introduction for you today. So um, we'll start right away with that. And thank you, everyone, for signing in. As I mentioned in the email, there will be um, uh, an, an ability for you to ask questions through the chat function on the GoToWebinar panel. Um, there is also um, a hand raising function. If you have a microphone, you can ask questions orally as well. So I'll be monitoring the questions, and we'll be stopping um, at various times throughout Anna's and Maria's presentation to uh, to see if you have any questions. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Anna Maria. Hello, everyone. Um, all right. Uh, thanks for taking the time today to uh, attend this webinar and learn a little bit more about data visualization. Um, I want to introduce uh, who I am and what it is that uh, I am doing here. So I'm currently a PhD candidate in computer science at UBC. Um, my past trajectory was that I did a lot of uh, bioinformatics and also some statistics. And through that came to work in um, clinical medicine, especially genomic areas, and more recently in public health. I'm doing my PhD in visualizing uh, public health data with uh, Tamara Munzner and Jennifer Gardy, both at the University of British Columbia. Okay. So uh, this webinar consists of two parts. Uh, today we're going to be talking about getting a high level understanding of data visualization and evaluation. And tomorrow we're actually going to be talking about different tools as well as their strengths and their limitations. I want to give you a sense of where we're going to go in the webinar today so you know kind of what's coming. The first thing we're going to talk about is why we should um, visualize data. Some of you may know this already, which is uh, why you're on the webinar, but I do want to talk about some of the work done in the research community about the benefits of data visualization. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about how we use data visualization, as well as some limitations to the current paradigm of how it's used. And finally, uh, we'll, I'll wrap up with how we visualize data. And the most, most of the talk will actually be spent in this final third section. I do want to sort of um, calibrate where this talk is going, because when I have um, given these sorts of presentations in the past, I realize that some people are expecting just to see a tutorial of, of Tableau or Shiny, and we will talk about that, but more tomorrow. Instead, I want you to think about these two different aspects of data visualization, which is how you actually make a visualization, those are the tools, and then deciding upon what is the right kind of visualization for the context uh, in which you are working in. And we're actually going to spend this uh, talk today on what is the right kind of data visualization. And tomorrow's portion of the webinar is going to be spent on how we make a visualization. OK, so without further ado, we are going to talk about why we should visualize data. I want to make a small note. Throughout this webinar, we're actually going to get these black screen section headers. And that's your opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so I will pause, and Anne can uh, bring up any questions that you may have at that time. OK. So one of the reasons we should think about visualizing data is because numbers are not always easy to reason about. Um, this graphic here shows how people translate assigned probabilities, uh, which are these values here on the x-axis, to English phrases or words. And so what you can see is that there's a general trend that when people think something has a 60% or above probability, it's generally associated with words that it's probably going to happen whereas something that is 40% or below is associated with words that suggest that it probably won't happen. But what you see is a considerable range. And so for some people, a 10% risk means that chances are quite slight, whereas some people might think 40% is that chances are quite slight. This is an interesting problem and one that got me motivated to think about data visualization because when we're communicating things like probability of survival to patients, everybody interprets a number differently with some degree of variation, and it affects the kinds of decisions that they're ultimately going to be making. 
And a lot of the research in medical risk communication has shown that people do have difficulty reasoning with numeric data. So numeracy uh, is the way that we describe this reasoning with numbers. And studies, in particular in the medical risk communication area of research, has shown that individuals with low numeracy have a hard time interpreting numbers. And low numeracy can affect as much as half of the population. Issues with numeracy are even true among uh, educated professionals. And so what the research community has found is that giving somebody a probability is often the most difficult, least understandable way to give them some information. Showing it as a frequency, for example, six and 10, as opposed to 60%, uh, improves comprehension. But then showing a data visualization often tends to be the most effective. Um, however, it's not just having a visualization that's important. Uh, the design of the visualization also matters. And so when I think about visualization design, I think about this quote from Steve Jobs, which is that design is a funny word. Some people think design means how it looks, but if you dig deeper, it's really about how it works. And so you might wonder, how do we think about a visualization working? So here are some concrete examples that demonstrate this for me. Uh, this is a study uh, that was done trying to understand how we should visualize the survival benefit of breast cancer therapy. Uh, what was There was a base visualization as well as two alternatives that were compared against in a randomized control uh, trial fashion with over 2,000 participants. The participants were not uh, patients that had breast cancer at the time, but they were women of a certain age that could have breast cancer. And so what this baseline visualization showed as a bar chart was in green, your base probability of survival, and then in uh, red, your probability of, of, um, of, of dying from cancer, and in sort of bluish purple, your probability of dying from some other cause. And then they showed this against getting different kinds of therapies. Alternative one and alternative two show the same kind of information, but in a different way. Here they're using something called an icon array, where there are actually 100 different little squares that are colored in, and the survival benefits uh, or chances of dying are, are uh, shown uh, as colored in squares. Now, in, in the first study that compared the baseline visualization to alternative one, participants preferred alternative one but it was still confusing. In a follow-up study that com compared alternative one to alternative two, um, participants preferred alternative two because it was much simpler. All they could see is their survival benefit, uh, their baseline survival in green, and then the added benefit in these two yellow, um, two yellow squares. Uh, and it was much simpler for them to reason about the benefit of the combined uh, chemotherapy and hormonal therapy relative to just hormonal therapy. And when uh, doing interviews with some of the participants, they would have changed their decisions based upon the kind of visualization that they were presented with. So this is a concrete example that visualization design also matters. And they did a really cool job in this study of actually um, really evaluating it in, in a paradigm that is similar to how we evaluate a lot of stuff in medicine and public health. But of course, there are more complex visualizations. So here's an example uh, from two research papers showing a transmission of a pathogen through a hospital. And they're showing roughly the same kind of information using a timeline, but they're also showing it in different ways and presenting different kinds of information as well. Um, in this case, we don't have an evaluation about which one is better. And there has maybe uh, not been a lot of thought into the design of which one is more effective and which is not. However, these kinds of graphics that show up in research tend to inform what we might do later on down the line when we're actually trying to create a public health report for dissemination. Now, the last example that I want to show about why visualization design matters is a bit more complex, but um, it's a really nice synthesis of being considerate towards the design as well as being smart about the evaluation. So this was work done by Michelle Bork Borkin, who's now at Northeastern, um, and she did a study where uh, they tried to redesign how arteries of the heart were visualized for surgical planning. So the standard visualization they were using is this uh, 3D model, which is right here. Oops, get that spotlight out. Uh, which is this 3D model here. And what she did was explore whether uh, a 2D representation with the same color scheme uh, was, uh, whether there was a difference. And then she also compared 
uh, changing the color scheme as well. So the default was this rainbow color scheme, and she went with this um, red and black diverging color scheme. She also did a sort of a, a multi-arm randomized trial kind of design to do the evaluation component. Uh, and it was done using um, medical residents uh, that were trained to look for blockages in arteries and a gold standard data set from a senior physician who had uh, pre-scored everything ahead of time. And so what they found was that, oh, having some difficulty advancing. Uh, Oh, there we go, let's see. Let me change back to the pointer. Great, sorry about that. So what they found was that um, the existing standard, which was this 3D uh, representation with this rainbow uh, color scale, had an accuracy of about 39%. Whereas the revised visualization that flattened everything out, it was still anatomically true in terms of the hierarchy of the arteries, um, had and had this uh, red black diverging color scale had an accuracy of 91%. And part of the reason for these differences was with the standard, they had uh, physicians had to mentally rotate it and keep track of where things were, whereas everything was laid out in this 2D version and the color scheme was a lot easier to see. Uh, so this changed standard of practice um, for, for that hospital. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how do we use data visualizations. I'll pause for a moment if there are any questions at this point. Uh, I don't see any questions at the moment, Anna, but I'm just wondering if you might uh, reference um, the software that was used for those data visualizations that you just showed. Sure, no problem. So for this uh, data visualization of the, of the arteries of the heart, this was made with processing, uh, which is uh, a JavaScript library. Um, the earlier visualizations were likely made by hand, uh, so there was no reference in the in the different um, in the in the papers as to whether any specific tools were used. Yep. Okay, so I'll continue now to how we use data visualizations in science. So generally, the role of data visualization has been for communication purposes. So what I have observed usually happens is that you might have a research problem, maybe not at the moment, but in the future, you will do uh, some sort of uh, research to understand what this, what's going on. And then once you've done all the research and you have the results, at that point, you want to tell other people about what you've actually found. And it has been my observation that at this point of communication is when people start to think about data visualization. Um, so we recognize some limitations uh, with, with numeracy, and we think if only we could summarize it, maybe make a nice infographic, then it'd be really easy for everybody to understand. And then we might actually check in whether this effort worked, and the answer is maybe it didn't, maybe you'll try something else, maybe you'll keep iterating through this cycle, or maybe you've got other things to do. And so at some point, you'll just say, okay, well, good enough, and we're going to move on. There are two limitations to this uh, paradigm that I want to uh, bring up. So one is we missed the opportunity of using data visualization for exploration, uh, which is before we actually communicate anything to anyone. And that means we can use data visualization to look at our data, to check our assumptions, and to check if there are outliers or missing uh, bits of information we should be aware of. There's a nice example of in the statistics and information visualization community of um, how summary statistics can be uh, inadequate or at times misleading. So ANSCOM's quartet is um, four different um, graphs where if you actually look at them, they are quite different. Whereas uh, if you plot the summary statistics, they are identical between each of these different graphs. Um, so this is a very famous and old example, but there is one that has come up this year, um, which was new and cute. Uh, that also uh, highlights the challenges raised by ANSCOM's quartet. So here we just have some very basic summary statistics of the mean in X, the mean in Y, the standard deviation, and the correlation. Nothing about this is particularly off or different or weird until you actually look at the graph. And when we look at the graph, uh, all those summary statistics are actually of this Tyrannosaurus or little dinosaur. So you wouldn't actually get that there's a dinosaur in your data until you actually um, looked at your data. And in fact, the Autodesk research group that did this um, went further to show 
how um, even different versions of this dinosaur could have the same summary statistics. So I'm going to take a moment to show you what uh, they did. I'm going to switch over here to my Chrome window. Okay. And so what you should be seeing is this little animation here where all of these different graphs have the same summary statistics. The uh, uh, thousandth decimal points are changing, but just to two decimal points, uh, they're, they're identical. Uh, and so this really emphasizes the importance of actually taking a look at what is in your data um, far before the final communication step. Okay. Uh, view full screen mode. Okay, so now we should be back at the slides. Yeah, it looks good, thank you. Okay, the second limitation, which is one that we're gonna be talking about the most, is that when we just think of data visualization for communication and as an afterthought, we miss how actually it can be quite challenging of finding the appropriate data visualization for the context. Uh, and so there's a lot of ways that you can visualize data. Uh, and this, is, these, this limitation is true both for exploration as well as communication purposes. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the talk discussing. Okay. Uh, so I'll pause again here uh, before we move on to how we should visualize data to see if um, there are any questions uh, at this time. Okay, so your opportunity, if you'd like to use the chat function or raise your hand if you have a question, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, that looks like there might be one. Um, a question. I might have miss, missed this, but just wondering for the arteries example, what was accuracy referring to? Uh, that's a good point. So let's go back there quickly. So in this case, uh, what the uh, individuals were tasked, what the students were tasked on doing was finding blockages in the arteries. And so what this um, base visualization would show uh, is areas where there was a lot of shear pressure, uh, which is a metric that uh, was important for uh, surgical planning. And so what they would have to do is sort of identify areas of high pressure indicating a potential blockage uh, within this visualization. And so you can see like uh, red here would be an example of where there would be a blockage and you might see at some little points where there are some red areas of blockage. In this visualization, the higher shear pressure is actually shown as, as black uh, because of the way she's chosen the scale. And what you can see lay out, laid out far more clearly is these areas of black, including these little small points uh, where there is a blockage occurring. Does that uh, hopefully, I hope that answers your question. Um, another question. Uh, yep. What is the difference between infographics versus data visualization? Uh, I think that you might get different um, you might get sort of, uh, you might get different answers depending on who you talk to. Um, generally, I find that infographics is more about graphic design, where we are um, trying to tell a story through um, through pictures. You can certainly do that with data visualization as well, but one of the differences is that instead of relying on just sort of graphic designs and laying it out, there is a lot more thought into the data analysis process, as well as the way that people are interpreting different kinds of information. So the way I see it is if you want a, an infographic, it might be best to actually consult a graphic design person. Uh, whereas if you want a data visualization, it might actually be best to talk to a data analyst um, uh, and somebody within uh, computer science who uh, could build these more data intensive visualizations. Um, I hope that that is, um, I hope that that is a, a useful explanation. There's certainly, um, it's not perfectly clear cut. Uh, I will also say that uh, infographics are almost always used for presentation and communication. It's very hard to think about how you would use an infographic for uh, data exploration or data analysis, whereas data visualization can also be used for, for both. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, are another, there any other questions? Yeah, another question from Sorry? Jenny. Could you repeat the name of the descriptive graphs? And then she's got the quartet in question mark. Yes. Um, this one is called Enscom's Quartet. Uh, it's a very famous example that was used by uh, that sorry that was generated actually by a statistician. Uh, it's very uh, easy to um, to find it just by doing a quick Google search. Uh, this one with the dinosaur, which is new, is, is called Datasaurus, um, and the link is this Autodesk research. Uh, same stats, different graphs. Yeah, and this is a is a more modern, I think, a bit more um, fun example of the the point that uh, the point about the limitations of just summary statistics. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think that's all the questions for now. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, how we should visualize data. And again, this is really high level, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be bringing up are still topics of active research. Okay, so this this first slide is trying to talk about the different cross-cutting disciplines that inform uh, visualization design and analysis in, um, in information visualization research. Um, data visualization and information visualization can be used uh, interchangeably. The research community calls itself information visualization. And this may also kind of get at the difference between uh, infographics as well as um, more data visualization, which, like I said, infographics is mainly about sort of graphic design, uh, whereas data visualization is about uh, a lot more about data analysis. Um, and so the methodology and the practices from the data visualization community or the information visualization community are informed by research that is actively being carried out in psychology, specifically human perception and cognition, um, computer graphics, which is you know how you actually make the scatter plot appear on a, a monitor, uh, as well as data analysis, because there's a lot of, of data wrangling, of data transformation um, that is involved in creating a data visualization. And then finally, uh, there are principles that are have been developed and that are unique to visualization design and analysis. I am going to go a little bit more into how all these cross-cutting disciplines uh, influence methodology in information visualization. But to put it all together to see why these things matter, I want you to think about the process of encoding information and the process of decoding information. So when you have an Excel spreadsheet and it's, it's a data table in front of you, it does not necessarily have an inherent visual form. Uh, so it doesn't mean that this data is automatically a scatter plot or automatically a line plot. Actually, you make a decision how you take that data table and transform it into a visualization that other people um, will consume uh, or even that you might consume in your process of, of trying to understand your, your models and your data. And so the first part of encoding is actually doing a data analysis, which could involve wrangling your data, deriving new variables. Um, for example, in public health, we rarely use counts. We usually derive rates. Um, once you have the data that you actually want to visualize, there is that next step of choosing the data visualization, which is in this area of visual mapping. Once you've chosen that data visualization, that actually has to get displayed on a computer screen which means that it has to um, not only display relatively quickly so people don't lose patience for it, but you also need to have um, pixels in order to display it. So perhaps we've all seen those visualizations that are, are blurry and overly dense when somebody has basically tried to show um, millions of rows of data uh, all at once. Uh, and so this is something to consider as well. Now, once you actually have the visualization and someone is seeing it, maybe on a computer screen most likely, but even maybe uh, in, in a paper or someplace that, that you may actually print it uh, to provide it with other individuals, somebody looking at that data visualization has to try to process what the information, uh, what information is in there. And that's where we start to come into the limitations of human perception, as well as the limitations of human cognition. So cognition starts to become this 
this issue of numeracy that we talked about earlier on. And even though visualizations help individuals that have lower numeracy, um, they can still be uh, confused by the wrong kind of data visualization, or they might still need a different kind of visualization in order for them to, to process the information more readily. So this process of encoding and, and decoding um, is really important to think about as, as a whole holistic pipeline of of making a data visualization and then seeing how somebody interprets it. I do want to talk a little bit more about perception because I think that for some people that might make sense and for others it might be the first time that, that you have thought about it relative to data visualization. And so I have um, two concrete examples. Uh, so one example is uh, colorblindness. And so uh, in bioinformatics, we have a tendency to create these kinds of um, heat maps that are um, red and green. Of course, if you're actually colorblind, uh, you can't see the heat map or, or the differences in the, in the heat map. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of colorblind simulators online that allow you to understand how individuals with different perceptual challenges would actually view the data. So in this case, you can see the difference between the non-colorblind versus how a colorblind individual would perceive that as well. Now, not everybody is colorblind. Um, so I wanted to also sh uh, provide a popular example that, that went around the internet a couple years ago, which was of the dress, um, where people were debating whether this dress was blue and black or white and gold. Um, for me, it's blue and black. I've never been able to see it any other way. Um, but there is actually um, a bunch of different visual tricks that we know that we can, um, that, that we know that uh, humans can fall into um, when they are trying to, to understand a graphic in front of them. Perhaps the most relevant is actually thinking about individuals that are, that are colorblind or that have different visual needs uh, and their ability to interpret the data as well, uh, at, down to even just seeing the visualization correctly. Okay, so that, that's the point I wanted to make about perception. So uh, in my work and in the work of a lot of information visualization researchers, what we're trying to do is to take all the knowledge from, from these different cross-cutting fields um, that is evolving over time and to distill it into some sort of graphic. Um, it's not actually trivial to do this. Um, sometimes there are different rules of thumb that come up, uh, and some of them are, are anecdotal of, you know, 3D is generally really hard to interpret versus 2D, which we saw in that artery example. Um, but uh, coming up with rules of thumb that apply uh, across the board and to everything is actually quite challenging to do. So what I'm trying to do with the rest of this presentation is actually um, give you a sense for visualization design and analysis so that you can think critically through your own visualizations and visualizations that you are consuming. Uh, and it's just to give you this basic intuition and let you know to stay tuned for, for more work that's coming out of this field over time. So I am gonna take a small pause here in between this section before we go on, um, because it's a good point to break and see if anybody has questions about these um, cross-cutting disciplines, about encoding and decoding, um, perception and cognition, uh, and so on. So is this, this is an opportunity for questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll just pause here because I realize this is a good point for some folks to, um, uh, to, to ask some questions before we, we dive deep into some more detail. Okay, there is a question from Heather. Um, are there any tools you would recommend for identifying color palettes that are accessible to visually impaired persons? I know you referenced a website, but are there other things as well? Yes, there is one called um, Color Brewer. And this was done uh, for, for maps, actually. And if you are using R packages, you can also um, use Color Brewer within R. That is by far the most popular um, tool out there. Um, you can also just Google it. Um, Color Brewer also has an online interface. And you can select um, palettes based upon um, you know, how much data you're trying to show, what kind of data it is. Um, uh, as well as whether you need to be colorblind friendly or print friendly, uh, et cetera. Um, we could, I mean, my, my, uh, my prof has like a whole lecture on color because showing color uh, can be uh, 
quite complex, um, especially, you know, humans, it turns out, can only really distinguish between 12 different colors really, really well. So if you've got a lot of different groups and each group is assigned a color, at some point you saturate the ability of normal humans to see the difference between them. And Color Brewer doesn't solve that problem yet. That becomes a hard problem where the solution isn't actually more colors. The solution tends to be um, clustering your data differently. I will also say that if you are using a Tableau, they have an excellent color researcher, um, Maureen Stone, um, and a lot of the color palettes in Tableau are very, very well designed, um, and you can take advantage of them as well. Um, a lot of the defaults are quite considerate in terms of uh, perceptual limitations of humans. So I think they have the Tableau 10 is the basic, and they actually have a Tableau 20 as well which gives you a sense of how many different things you can color based upon um, human perceptual limits. Aside from that, on this particular slide, um, there are different tools out there that allow you to check the graphic that you've made to see uh, how a colorblind individual would, um, would view it. Um, you just load a, a JPEG or a PDF to the website. These are also very easy to find if you Google it as well. Okay. Great, great. Thank you very much, Anna. I don't, I don't have any other questions at the moment. Okay, so now we're going to deep dive into this idea of how do we think about data visualizations. And like I said, just sort of a, uh, uh, kind of a, a high level uh, intuition for it. So I think that you can break down data visualizations into three different um, questions. So one is why are you making it in the first place? So why do you need to visualize the data? And how will you or others use the data visualization? You should also consider um, what you're visualizing. And this is the data and the tasks. So the data is literally what kind of data is being visualized. And the tasks are to consider how people uh, use that data to perform some task. And then the last part is finally the part that you know, we all care about, which is how do we actually um, visualize the data? And that's both the visual and the interaction design and asking the questions about whether we've made the right visualization. People tend to ignore the why and the what and they jump to the how, which means that you often have this really pretty data visualization that is not well matched for the context. Uh, so one example, when I was working in prostate cancer research, I had to create a report uh, that would show the survival probability of, for, for men with prostate cancer based on an analysis of their cancer genomics. And since the population was mostly male, we had to address issues of red, green color blindness because there would be more instances of it in that population. We wouldn't get that if we jump straight to the how. We need to understand the why and the what in order to understand the constraints um, into how we made that data visualization. And the reason why uh, these questions are useful is because not only can you consider design around why, what, how, but you actually have meaningful ways to then evaluate what you've done. So, you know, for why you might think, does the data visualization actually address a need it's supposed to address? For the what, you might be thinking of, are you using the right data or are you deriving the right data? This is the difference between using counts versus rates, for example. Uh, you might also think of, does the visualization support the kinds of tasks for the different people that would be using it? And finally, you would think about the how, um, where you ask, it, are the visual and interactive choices appropriate for the data and tasks? Um, and is it a, a reliable data visualization if it's interactive in that it doesn't crash all the time and people see it reasonably consistently? Um, this idea of why, what, how um, is, can be further broken down into something that is called the nested model for visualization design and analysis. And so this is a bit of theory that comes out of the information visualization community, where we think about the domain situation or the motivation, the data and the tasks, the visual and the interactive encoding, as well as the algorithms. And then we can use different kinds of evaluation methods from traditional computer science methods, to studies that we would use in epidemiology or even sociology, um, to larger uh, field studies and adoption studies to understand how a visualization um, is adopted and used. Now for something really small or basic, maybe you don't have to do something so grand. However, if you really want a visualization that you know a bunch of people understand and uh, the interpretation and context is very important, then you might want to actually do some more intensive studies to make sure that you've got it right. 
I'm now going to talk about each of these steps in more detail and also give you a sense of how they might relate in a public health context as well. Okay, so um, the nested model starts from the domain problem and works its way in towards uh, visual and interactive design choices as well as algorithm. Algorithm might be the most confusing uh, if you're coming from a public health um, background. Uh, it's more related to sort of computer science and how we actually show the thing on the screen in some reasonable manner uh, or how we create new kinds of visualizations. Um, Tableau has a lot of really great algorithmic implementations that you don't see that is important for the visualizations you create. Uh, so moving in is a design process and moving out is an evaluation process. Uh, and this is also iterative. So we don't just go through design once and then evaluation once. We can actually cycle through this multiple times. Uh, an evaluation in um, visualization research follows something that is called an agile development model. This is borrowed from ideas of software engineering. So what you can do is toil away, create this visualization, and then only get feedback at the end, um, which is not ideal because there's going to be differences in how you interpret the data and what people need. Instead, it's good to slowly build towards something that's more complex. So you might start out with something small, get some feedback, you know, develop that and keep working on it until you have this more complex thing um, that has had multiple evaluations along the way and that is better suited for what different people want. So now let's talk a little bit more about these individual steps. So the domain problem is really about identifying a relevant problem that affects you or a group of stakeholders. And in public health, um, we actually have multidisciplinary decision-making teams, um, which is the interesting part for me in my own research, where we have to communicate our findings or share uh, and discuss our findings with a wide variety of people, um, from researchers to medical health officers to politicians. And so we have this idea of a, of a data-driven, evidence-based decision-making model, but as you have all of these different stakeholders, they all have different needs of the data and different abilities to interpret it. And taking all these different needs into consideration is important, not just for statistical analysis, but for visualization design and analysis as well. The next part is talking about data and tasks, which is, you know, what data do people use? Is it available? We often run into that constraint in public health contexts where um, maybe people want low level individual data, but all we can get it as aggregate data. We run into issues of, of permissions. It takes a really long time to get the data. And this is actually important to consider um, because you might not actually make the thing that you want to make or the thing that people need uh, is too hard because it's too hard to get at the data. And then you might also think about what stakeholders do with that data, which is the tasks that they perform. And so um, usually in public health, we're used to thinking about tabular data. That's stuff that we can actually put into Excel. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other different kinds of data um, from networks um, to fields. That, that's more about some of the physics, engineering, um, geometry or spatial data. And then these really intense multidimensional uh, data tables as well as trees. And so there's different design considerations, different limitations that are also imposed by these different kinds of data. Um, you also, as I've said a few times, don't just want to show the data that you have. You also sometimes need to think about, do I need to do some analysis to get a more relevant data, um, data variable? So for example, in this example, the raw or the original data might be showing exports and imports, but what people actually wanna see or what's useful to see is trade balance. So when you just show exports and imports, people are mentally subtracting them and trying to get at this. Whereas if you've thought about the, the why and uh, the what, you will actually just provide this for individuals because you know it's something that they need. Um, there's also really great examples of when you just visualize what you have and just get misleading information. Uh, so my favorite example of this comes from XKCD, where people are just literally showing counts of um, all of these different variables and effectively getting back uh, population data, uh, which suggests that there is actually some sort of relationship and correlation when in fact it's not, it's just actually showing population maps. So don't just visualize the data you have, think about the data that you need, which might mean analysis, further analysis. 
Um, tasks are more complex to talk about, and I think an area where, again, you could spend a whole webinar on this. So what I'm showing here is an example from an analysis that I did. Um, we'll get back to a little bit more about this uh, after this uh, section, where we talked to people in different public health roles, and we looked at the different kinds of data they used to make different decisions for diagnosis, treatment, and surveillance tasks. And we looked at um, what the most important data types were. This would eventually go on to inform a, a report design. Again, I will provide some more details on that. Um, and it also showed us areas where, you know, surveillance is, is very uh, important, but there's not a really great consensus on what kind of data is used for the surveillance tasks. Whereas there's a lot more consensus on the kind of data that's important to use for diagnosis and treatment tasks. This was really important for us to know going in as designers because it allowed us to figure out, well, where do we need to get more information or um, what kind of data do we prioritize in uh, whatever visualization or clinical report we come up with. Okay, what each of the numbers are is just here is a code for high, some low uh, versus very low degree of consensus. These are the data and these are the different tasks. So now we've talked about the domain problems and the tasks. We finally get to uh, actually visualizing the thing. So you should actually explore um, whether other people have addressed this problem as well as tasks and data. So you may find that somebody else in some research paper has actually tried to think about this problem and may have already come up with something. It's useful to know um, what the alternatives might be as opposed to just jumping in to what you might think is, is your instinctual best answer. Uh, and then you could finally go ahead to actually implementing your own solution. And that implementation can be using a tool like Tableau. Uh, it could be using something like R. It could be using something more complex um, like JavaScript. And you should remember that this visualization can also include interaction. And I want to show you this example of a really interesting um, data visualization. Um, it's, it's not an interactive, but it's not static. So to give you a sense that there's a, a, a wider realm of, of possibilities than just whatever these tools can create. Okay, so now you should be seeing my Google Chrome screen. I'm going to show you uh, this brief YouTube video. This is from the Ebola outbreak. A lot of the data that was used here was uh, for the genomic data and what they're trying to show was the spread of data over time. Okay, so I'm gonna be playing it now. So what you'll see is uh, all the different centers that are transmitting the um, genomic, uh, sorry, that are transmitting the um, Ebola virus. All of these transitions are reconstructed from the genomic data. Uh, so if you think of ACTG, there's in, in DNA, there's nothing inherent about transition. There was a lot of, uh, sorry, about transmission. There was a lot of analysis that went into it. And it's showing over time how all of this, um, how, how this uh, virus is spreading. It's also presenting a phylogenetic tree as well as sort of the epidemic curves for the different countries. And so you, creating these kinds of visualizations uh, by hand is not super easy. Um, the person who did this did it uh, with Python and a lot of patients. Um, but it's, it's to give you a sense of, of how much uh, more expressive you can be than just simple static visualizations. Okay, back here. Um, full screen. Okay. Ebola. Oh. The world's most terrifying modern plague. Sorry. There we go. We went to the next video. All right. Continuing. Okay. I will do one small digression here as well. Uh, to think about visualization. Again, from the idea of InfoViz theory, you can break down a visualization into marks, which is actually a basic uh, graphical element or building block, as well as channels, which controls the appearance of the marks to where they actually appear on the screen. So those are things like position, color, shape, area, volume. Um, the InfoViz research community has actually take, taken a look at the um, how accurately people interpret information based upon these different types of marks as well as channels. And so there was original study in psychology published in the 80s called, uh, which is always referred to as Cleveland and McGill. 
Uh, and then there was some follow-up work that was done uh, in 2010 by Jeff Hare, uh, which is, he's a pretty prolific data visualization researcher at uh, Washington University. And they followed up on uh, Cleveland and McGill's original results and also uh, with some additional uh, chart types that were not covered by Cleveland and McGill. And so if you ever heard that idea of don't show a pie chart because they're not good, a lot of that comes from this um, perceptual and psychology research. And you can see it for yourself here where this is the same data represented as a pie chart as well as a bar chart. And it's, it's perceptually and cognitively easier to actually look at the different heights of these graphs. I mean, in this case, they're also all ordered, uh, but they are here as well, uh, instead of just looking at the pie chart. So you can see that there's a difference maybe between uh, red and black, but it's, just, it's hard to see and to understand that the difference is as large as you're seeing with the bar chart. And that's because of perceptual limitations uh, of different people that, that are sort of confirmed by these large scale studies. Okay. Um, Marks and channels might also seem like this really esoteric language, but it is actually practically used in a lot of data visualization packages. Uh, I'm showing here a, an example from R, where uh, channels are actually what are called um, aesthetics in the ggplot language, and marks are geoms in the ggplot language. And so they don't refer to it as marks and channels, but this concept of this basic graphical point to which you then add information like position and color to manipulate its appearance uh, is drawn from a lot of information visualization uh, research. And you will see that again with Tableau too. That's the small digression there. Um, the last part that I wanna mention, but only briefly is uh, that part of a visualization solution could also be an algorithm. I have mentioned a couple of different examples. One last one I will talk about is, you know, if you're showing a network and it's a hairball, summarizing that hairball visually or graphically is also an example of a way that you could use an algorithm. I think that, again, depending on where you're coming from and in your background, algorithm might be the part that you touch upon the least. Uh, whereas uh, the other three steps of um, domain problems, data and tasks, and visual interactive design choices are things that you may encounter more frequently and deal with in different kinds of tools that you're using to visualize data. And of course, once you have actually gone through this process once, you can uh, go back out and actually ask those evaluation questions of whether the visualization is suitable for the data and the tasks, and also whether it is suitable for the domain problem. You can also test multiple different alternatives. You don't just have to come up with one thing. You can come up with a couple of different things and you can try them. You can gather both qualitative and quantitative data. And finally, what evaluation means or how extensive it has to be depends on what you're trying to do. So if maybe you're just trying to publish something in a research paper where you have a specialized community and, and you know everybody or you roughly know what they talk about, then maybe your evaluation is just showing it to a colleague down the hall. Whereas if you're a researcher and you're trying to develop something that patients might use and you are um, have a very different perspective from the patients, your evaluation might need to be more intensive. You may actually need to run different kinds of studies and try all these different alternatives to see whether what you have is effective or not. Uh, so these are all the steps laid out. Again, going down this process is a design task and going up is an evaluation task. Um, so I know that there's all this information and you're wondering, well, how do I use it and how is it relevant to me? And this is actually something that I'm trying to understand and tackle in my own research. I'm really trying to bring together ideas from information visualization that are cool but kind of seconded in that community and combining it and presenting it in a way that is relevant for, for public health as well and, and other medical audiences. So we've just published this paper where we use the principles that I talked about today to redesign a um, genomics uh, clinical report for tuberculosis. And so what we have uh, in this paper are concrete ways in which we uh, identified how people would use the information. We explicitly um, laid out the different data and tasks that they had. And I had this little example earlier on that gave you a flavor of that. And then we show how we use that information to redesign a report. We did test a bunch of different kinds of alternatives uh, in terms of, of what people wanted to, to see and how. Uh, and with 
and when, with all that information together, we were able to um, finalize the design as well. There was not a lot of visualization design here. This was more information design, but it used all of the steps that I have described. And so if you, if you wanted to take a look at a concrete example in a public health space of how we use that uh, technique, um, this paper uh, should help you get oriented. At least I hope so, that was the intent. I am currently working um, on a follow-up, which is how we apply these principles to um, the creation of dashboards and more interactive complex visualizations uh, that are geared towards uh, public health audiences as well. So stay tuned for more details. One other question that I'm working on in my own research, and this is something that I've touched upon as well, is, under, is, is figuring out how we can help people explore the different kinds of data visualizations that, that exist. Um, so like I said, comparing against multiple alternatives, seeing if other people have tried to uh, visualize the kind of data and the kinds of problems you're working with is uh, is really important, but we don't have good tools to do that and we don't have ways to systematically compare these visualizations. And I'm going back to show these examples of, of spread in a hospital because um, for, for my particular area, I want to look at in, um, infectious diseases and genomic epidemiology. So that's also work um, that, that I'll be doing, uh, that I'm currently doing, and that I hope to provide both uh, to, to, the, to the research as well as the more uh, general community. So again, you can see how this sort of intuition I've given to, uh, I've hopefully imparted on you about data visualization is applied in practice. All right, so I just have one final slide for, um, a couple of slides for wrapping up. What I hope, to have conveyed to you today uh, is that data visualization is not just an art project. It is, um, it is in and of itself a data analysis process. And it can be quite an intensive process depending on what your outcomes are. Based upon today's learning goals, um, I hope that I've given you a high level introduction and understanding of data visualization, design and evaluation. And what I really wanted to get across to you was that data visualizations are, are actually useful, um, that numeracy is something that we have to think about, uh, and designing visualizations for, for individuals that have different um, degrees of numeracy is important, and that visualization can be used for communication in addition to exploration. I hope that I've also convinced you that visualization design matters, that there's a lot of different ways to visualize the same data, and that it's important to test. And the degree to which you test, again, depends on your outcomes. Um, I also hope that I've convinced you that it is possible to think a little systematically about data visualization. There are a lot of disciplines that cross cut it, so it's not just a graphic design problem. And um, at a bare minimum, it's important to think about why we're creating a data visualization, what data we're using to create that visualization, in addition to how we actually do that. Um, and sort of for, for follow on and an example of my own work, I've provided um, this uh, PureJ article. Um, that we've just published um, that, that shows these concepts in action in a very uh, simple problem. And so that ends my presentation. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom if you want to take a look at my own work or have any uh, additional questions for follow-up. Um, and I will take any uh, additional questions that you now have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for an excellent presentation. Um, I do have a question here uh, from Ryan. It says, new research from the cognitive neuro and linguistic sciences have shown that the ra rational actor model of decision making that has informed public policy for a long time is increasingly out of date as humans are making decisions via emotional responses that the data and information they are viewing and comprehending elicits. Are there any studies that measure emotional responses to various data visualization methods? I think there are, but I don't know any of them off of the top of my head. I do believe that the bulk of the data visualization work has actually focused on work from uh, cognitive psychology and perceptual psychology, as well as vision science, more than it has focused on um, sort of decision-making models. Um, I think that the way we kind of get at um, uh, non-rational decision makers is uh, through, you know, this, this intensive process of 
identifying the motivation, uh, sorry, of this intensive evaluation process um, that I talked about with respect to these three questions for data visualization. Um, but something that explicitly takes into consideration, um, not at that level of depth to my knowledge, uh, there are, um, there is an acknowledgement in the community that, that visualizations are created for the purposes of, of sort of entertainment and appealing more to feelings and emotions rather than just, um, uh, just, just the hard science and facts. Um, but actually bringing in different uh, decision-making models, not to my knowledge. Uh, I do know, I will add, that there's a one researcher called Alberto Cairo, and he is doing a lot of work uh, on understanding how you lie with data visualizations so that uh, people can think more critically about the information that they are digesting. Um, it's very easy to, to get an emotional response out of a visualization. Um, and, and it's because seeing something can be so effective, it, it's easy to bypass people's critical thinking. So there's more work now being done uh, in that area. Uh, any other questions? Thanks, thanks very much for your answer. And uh, maybe we could, if you uh, um, have the spelling for Alberto, maybe people could have a look at that. It sounds very interesting. Um, any, any other questions before we sign off? I know we're just about one minute over now, but um, oh, here another question from Megan. You mentioned that 3D representations are not the most intuitive to interpret. However, I've been thinking about patient journey mapping in the healthcare system and a way of visualizing this. I wonder if anyone has done any work or seen any work in this area. Um, yes, and not, okay, so um, yes, people have actually been thinking about how we allow people to tell effective stories with data visualization. So um, whether it's something as specific as um, patient journey mapping, I have not seen that in the data visualization community, although I don't doubt that that research does uh, exist outside of it. Within the, the data visualization research community, um, most of the emphasis is just more generally on storytelling. Um, so that's, it's not quite communication and it's not quite analysis, it's a nice synthesis in between. Uh, tomorrow we will uh, look through like several, we'll discuss um, several different tools that um, exist for visualizing data, and some of them are more optimized for that kind of storytelling that you might do with um, these uh, uh, patient journeys. Um, but a specific example for patient journeys in the data visualization community, I don't think so. There have been a lot of people that try to visualize, for example, message boards where patients um, you know, might talk to other patients to see like common issues or things like that but not patient journeys specifically. Um, and with respect to the first part of that question with 3D um, representations, uh, this becomes a part where, you know, sometimes 3D is the right thing to do because it's, it's entertaining, uh, or maybe you have data that's inherently 3D and spatial and it's, it's worthwhile to visualize it in 3D. Although, as we saw from the example of the heart artery, uh, that's not always uh, necessarily correct because arteries are 3D, but it's still hard to see um, the, all of the different heart blockages accurately. Often the problem with 3D representations is this issue of occlusion, because you still have a 2D screen. And so you're not ever seeing something in true 3D. Even in real life, we don't see things in true 3D. Uh, for example, when I'm, if you're looking at a person face on, you don't see their front and their back at the same time usually only see one part of them and you infer the rest. Uh, and so there's this, the problem with 3D is you're trying to keep track of an abstract object in your head and rotate it and try to think about what you've seen previously. And your brain is actually working really hard to do that. And at some point it, it maxes out and it, it, it can't do that anymore. And so you lose information. And now going back to what we talked about, this why and the what and the how, um, Maybe the point of keeping track of all this information is not super important in a, in a patient journey. And seeing something in 3D that's more interactive and flashy 
is entertaining for them or it's even important for them because um, it gives them some some feeling that is positive. Um, maybe makes them feel more engaged. And if that's the point and you can achieve that with 3D, then then maybe you should use it. However, if what you're looking for is, is accuracy, ease of understanding, ease of interpretation, it's not the best thing to use. Uh, and so the appropriate use of something is still context dependent based upon what, what you want the outcome to be for, for that particular thing you're doing. I hope that that answers your question. Thank you, Anna. I, I'm, I think that uh, there will probably be an opportunity to maybe revisit some of this tomorrow as well. Um, people are out wondering about um, availability of the slide deck and the training data. So, as I mentioned, we will provide that for them and um, these sessions will also be recorded as well. So, uh, people will have an opportunity to maybe revisit and digest uh, all the information that you provided today. So thank you very much for all your hard work and everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow uh, at the same time. Thank you very much. All right, bye for now. Bye.